Ladies and gentlemen, our referee has called a stop to this contest, declaring the winner by knockout and new MMA Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another exciting round of and new MMA show. I am your host, Michael Hansen, and I do all kinds of brolic things with microphones <laughs> because I am a ring announcer and MMA cage announcer. And I am joined this week, as I always am, by my two buddies who bring MMA punditry to new heights. Joining us first on the left side of your screens, all the way from New York, Mark Prio. Say hi, buddy. What's up, boys? Just in the screen here, get my angles right. I'm a little pissed because I ordered a new sexy microphone. And in all the pictures, it comes with a fucking boom and a stand. So you like have your choice. And all the descriptions are like, has your choice of boom and stand, blah, blah, blah. I ordered the damn thing. It shows up today. It's just a microphone. It doesn't come with the boom or the stand. Oh. So I can't use it. I had to order a boom, and we'll see how it goes next week. Nice, nice. I uh, can't wait to hear uh, the dulcet tones of your voice on this uh, oh, $2,000 uh, microphone. People are gonna be like, <laughs> I don't even know how much you paid. I feel like you paid so, so much sexy. money. Oh, my God. And the answer is going to be always. And ladies and gentlemen, we are graced with the presence of the Nicaraguan nightmare tonight. Uh, Omar Artola joining us all the way from Florida. He is undefeated, ladies and gentlemen. Omar against the coronavirus, COVID-19 Whatever variant it might be, my man is undefeated. He put that shit in a Google Plata uh, yesterday. He texted us and it was like, guys, I have COVID. I feel like crap. Might not be able to do the podcast. This morning we wake up in the, in the text thread. Mark is like, how are you, bro? He's like, tell me, a, tell me a night's sleep and you're over this thing. And Omar was like, I kind of am. So, <laughs> hey, you did it, buddy. You, uh, you defeated COVID. Fucking body bag that shit. I appreciate it. Uh, honestly, that was kind of shitty. I, uh, I had, it was one day for me. Um, I'm pretty sure I got it at the gym. It's kind of the only place I go, like outside at this Where point. Where you like hug people? Um, the fucked up thing is I haven't really done clinching in a long time. It's really just been a lot of striking. So I really thought I, I mean, let's be real. I'm still really close to people. But I just thought if I was gonna get it, it'd be during a clinch day, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, I went to a seminar on Saturday, um, with this really, uh, his name is, uh, Ray and uh, he's one of the founders of Tampa Muay Thai. And in fact, he's basically responsible for bringing Muay Thai to Tampa specifically <clears throat> the goddamn sport of Muay Thai to wow. Tampa. Um, so I'm, I'm super fortunate to really find out how serious that gym is that I'm going to. And I, you know, it's, it's, it's really been great, but caught the COVID and I woke up yesterday and it felt like somebody beat the whole shit out of me. Um, I was sore the entire day by like 11 in the morning. I had to tell my job I, I couldn't do it anymore. And I work remote. So it's not even like I had to go home. I just couldn't like be alert. I was just in so yeah. much pain. Huh. Um, tried to do a, a Epsom salt bath. I got the chills in a hot Epsom salt bath. And then that's why I was like, oh, this is fucked up. Um, so uh, got out, turned the heat up in my house, put on some sweats uh, and then basically tried to go to bed for a little while, told my wife what was going on and she ended up getting me a COVID test and found out I had the COVID. So long, terrible, painful night. Um, just a lot of soreness. I didn't really have any of the congestion issues. Thank God that a lot of people were talking about, but it still wasn't fun for sure. No. no. Well, Hey man, glad that you are uh, feeling better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Glad I was able to do this. Cause yesterday, normally guys, we, we, we tape on Tuesdays and we get it out for you Wednesday mornings. Um, but this week we changed it up and, you know, life has our, our, our requirements. So I'm glad that, uh, we made that change early on because if it was for yesterday, <laughs> boy would not have been here. Not at oh all. Boy. Oh so, boy. <laughs> would have been our out. first, would have been our first two man show, yep. but it's not, it's not. We're keeping the streak alive guys. Yes. Well, folks, uh, we have a, a, a very fun, very exciting episode. A lot of, uh, exciting things to discuss on this week's episode, we're going to start at the top, as we always do with On the Marquee. And, of course, we're going to be discussing the aftermath of UFC 270 in Gano versus Gone. We're going to talk about some other key matchups that were on that card. We're going to jump into our lightning round, which, of course, we love here. Uh, we're going to find out who rose and who fell in, the, in our very own Prio rankings system. 
then we're going to dive inside the MMA sphere, and then we're going to look ahead to this weekend's Bellator 273 card, Bader versus Moldovsky. Before we get into any of that, of course, thank you so much for joining us. If you're watching this on YouTube, go right ahead and click on that subscribe button. Hit the bell button so that you never miss an episode. Please, if you like any of our takes or disagree with any of our takes, Drop us a comment, guys. Let us know what you think. We would love to engage with you in some nice, friendly MMA dialogue. Uh, if you want audio only, find us wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, follow us on social media at and new underscore MMA show. With that being said, guys, this week, the name on the marquee has got to be Francis the Predator in Ganu, who this past Saturday night at UFC 270 in Anaheim, California, he successfully defended his UFC heavyweight title, defeating his former teammate, Cyril Ghosn, via unanimous decision, earning a 48-47, 48-47, and 49-46 on the judges' scorecard. This was his first title defense and came against an opponent who many thought was a terrible matchup for Francis in terms of pure striking prowess, that being in Cyril Ghosn. Mark, let me start with you. How are you feeling about uh, the aftermath of this fight? Were you surprised and what are your thoughts? I mean, that went exactly how I thought it was going to go. Francis <laughs> Ngannou via wrestling. <laughs> oh I mean, geez, who the hell saw that one coming? Like, my God, um, what a performance for Francis Ngannou. I, I can't act like for a single second I ever considered Francis was going to win that fight with wrestling and grappling. If anything, I, I thought that Gan would have the advantage in the grappling department just because we've seen him submit some guys. Like it just seemed like he was a little more versed down there. I never thought in Ghana would be initiating those types of situations. So that was mind blowing to see. Uh, I know some people found the fight boring to me. I was into it all along because I couldn't believe what I was watching. Like this man, mm -hmm. Francis and who couldn't even grapple three years ago, who, who Stipe, tossed all around the cage and basically toyed with on the ground won three straight rounds of a title fight that he was down two nothing in mm -hmm. via grappling. Like I, I was just watching, like I, I cannot believe that this is what this man is doing right now. So to me, I was into it the whole time. Um, and it was a close fight uh, to, to walk through it real quick. Round one, honestly, was a really close round. I don't hate it being scored either way. Um, but the style in which the round was fought kind of made you feel like the fight may be playing out the way that gone wanted it to play out. And I did kind of just feel like maybe he edged the round. Then around two that fully happens. We shift into the typical, I hate to say it kind of boring Cyril gone fight where he stays way outside and he picks you apart and he's so fast that you can't touch him. And he just beats mm -hmm. you on points. And that's what we watched it in, in round two. And then round two ends. And it was kind of like, man, I don't know how Francis is going to figure this out. Like you, you kind of started to get that feeling like Francis may be in trouble here unless he kind of just lands a bomb somehow. Then in round three, there's that demonstrative moment where it feels like the whole fight changes on a dime, which is when Francis catches that kick and body slams gone into the mat. And it was like, holy shit, like what's happening here? And next thing you know, Francis is in side control. He's moving to mount for a minute. He gets gone to turn his back. He's putting his hooks in. He's he's landing shots here and there throughout. And like, yeah, gone gets up after a bit. But you're like, what the hell did I just see? Mm -hmm. Then a minute later, before you can even recover from the shock, Francis is freaking judo throwing him. He almost gets it. Gone kind of like smashes his head on the mat a, a, a little bit. Um, and then he gets another takedown late in the round, which he clearly wins. So it's now two to one if you if you did give gone the first two. And as they stand, frankly, gone, like looked a little bit disheartened. Like he was kind of mm -hmm. like shit. Like this is not something I thought I was going to have to be dealing with. Then round four and Ganu gets two more takedowns. He's active. He's not landing a ton, but he's moving. He's changing position. He's landing here and there. And I heard some people questioning in Ganu's activity saying he was just laying on him, but to this point in the fight, I didn't feel like that was the case at all. I, I felt like all these exchanges on the ground were pretty active. I felt like Ngannou was looking to advance. You know, Gan was trying to get up, and Ngannou was keeping him there, looking for a way to find shots. So to, to this point in the fight, I didn't feel like there was any laying happening, really. I, I, I was into it. Um, mm -hmm. 
Then before round five in the corners, we get Fernando Lopez yelling at Gon, you have to win this fight. You have to win this fight. And I don't know if something got lost in translation and maybe it did, but you see that. And then you see in Ganu's corner, giving him actual advice, telling him they believe in him and so on. And it was just like, man, what a notable contrast for what is happening in these two corners right now, as we go into round five of a, of a fight that that's probably even and Round five starts. They come out. I got to say, Gon is actually taking it to him in the stand-up for like a minute and a half. Like he le- lands a couple real clean shots. He gets a takedown of his own. And then there was kind of another moment where it was like, wow, Gon's going to do this after all. Mm-hmm. And then what the hell happens? Francis and Gon who hits a damn sweep. Yo. Like probably the craziest <laughs> moment of the whole fight. Yep. Like, And now Gon maybe kind of looked for a leg attempt at the same time, which may have helped it. But either way, Nganu traps Gon's leg under his own, is able to sit up, flip flip the momentum, reverse the position, end up on top. And from there, Gon truly goes for the leg lock, which we have maybe the little scare for a minute there. But Francis stays safe, adjusts, gets out to take the back, eventually ends up on top again. And now, with about maybe two minutes left in the fight, is the only time where I feel like you could accuse Nganu of kind of laying there. I feel like this was the first time that that really happened. But even right when it got stagnant and I was like, I wonder if Herb's going to start saying shit. Gon tried to sit up and, and Gon who had to kind of fight the sit up and, and fix the position. So it never really hit that moment where it was like it needed to be stood up. Do I wish Nganu maybe would have thrown a little more late? Yeah, especially because I thought round five actually was a really close round. Like when Ngan- even when Nganu was on top toward the end, I was kind of like, man, I think we got to land a few here to make sure we get this round. I was pulling for Nganu. So I did want to see a little more activity from him late and he did kind of just play it a, a little bit safe mm-hmm. um but i i think i gotta give him the round but i gotta say round five i've watched it twice i, I wish i had time to watch it a third time but i did not um was a really debatable round like hmm. yes and finished with with all the momentum and everything but like i couldn't help but think like if that round happened in the reverse order like if Nganu took him down and laid on him for two and a half minutes and then gone went for a leg lock and then gone got on top. And then for a minute and a half gone out, struck him and was landing clean shots. Mm-hmm. I think it would end it. And I would have been like, I think gone won that round. You know what I mean? I feel like it's very much like the order of events. So I don't know that that was a closer round than I realized live, but I was happy. Francis won. I think that overall I did feel like he deserved it. Um, it was really, really close, but hey, the man got it done. He did it on apparently what was one leg we learned after the fight. He did it in a way that no one imagined he possibly could, in a way that mm-hmm. he had to figure out when he was down to nothing. And bottom line is that man is a hell of a champion. Absolutely. Omar, the fight didn't give us a signature in Ganu knockout, but it certainly had some exciting moments. What were the most exciting moments for you. What were your reactions to the outcome of this title fight? After the first round, it was pretty clear that Nganu was probably not going to be able to touch him, at least not cleanly. Um, Gon kind of had his number when it came to that kind of stuff and and looked very confident moving around. And the way that he moves is, is just so loose. Um, and Nganu, and it, it very well might have been the leg injury that, that was going on, but Nganu almost looked like he was starting to wear at the end of the first round, uh, you know, his mouth was open while he was breathing. It just kind of looked like his cardio had taken kind of a hit early on in the fight earlier than at least I had expected. Um, so I, I knew from a striking standpoint, this was probably going to be a long night for, for Nganu. There was obviously mm-hmm. still that chance that Nganu could touch his chin within five rounds, but just from the way the first round and the second round went, I just couldn't see that happening mm-hmm. in the third round. The, the takedown, that first big slam, I really took it as an opportunistic takedown. Boom, I got it. I'm on top. I'm just going to stay here until he can get me off. You know, I'm, I'm winning. Might as well stay down here and just keep winning. Then I think he, you know, he may have found that as the path of least resistance at that point. But the fact that he was still able to take him down almost at will was, I think, the most impressive part. And you can say what you want about the wrestling from both sides. You can say what you want about, you know, whether other fighters in that division's wrestling is better or not than theirs. But the reality is, is that was effective wrestling mm-hmm. and he was able to use it to control gone for the better part of three rounds. Um, the sweep 
That sweep was a thing of beauty. I don't give a fuck who you are. I don't care what you say about that fight. That sweep was a thing of beauty. Uh, <laughs> I did not see that coming in a million years. Yep. So I thought it was, I thought it was fantastic. Um, but you got to give him credit. You got to give him credit because at the end of the day, that after round two, being able to adjust like that in the middle of a fight is very, very difficult. And the fact is, you only really see champions do that shit. Most of the time, guys will start, you know, will stick to the game plan that they worked. Because switching on the fly is just, you, you might, you're basically pissing in the wind. You're just winging it, right? Um, but we've seen people like Henry Cejudo adjust on the fly. Or, you know, adjust in between rounds, come back, and succeed viciously. And so it was it was nice to see Nganu kind of, I don't want to say put the pride aside, because I don't necessarily know if he had a lot of pride in, in knocking out Cyril Gan, But putting aside what the expectation was of him yeah. dropping bombs, basically. And that's, you know, what the people want to see in being focused on coming out with the W because I think he knew it probably wasn't going to happen. Um, I thought it was a great fight. I, I was, I could see, I guess why a couple people said it was boring, but I, I really didn't feel that way at all. Yeah. I, I had a feeling that it was going to be like that. I did not think we were going to get a gun knockout, uh, uh, um, an Ingano knockout. I thought, I mean, I, last week I predicted that we were going to see a gun, uh, unanimous decision victory. Uh, where the first two rounds were going to be pretty much the whole fight. Um, but it was very surprising. Francis Ngannou reminded us all that fighters can learn. <laughs> they can continue to develop even when they've reached the top of the mountain. They can continue to add skills to their bag. And some fighters don't. Like some fighters, you know, you, you do feel like you have a sense of what this guy is good at, great at what he specializes at and what skills he's going to bring into the fight, what game plan he might try to execute with his skill set. What's hard to predict is what Francis did, a guy who has a highlight reel that can go up against anybody's in terms of knockouts, but we never would have guessed in a million years that he was going to go in there and grapple somebody and out grapple somebody. Out grapple. Yep. Yep. I mean, just tremendous. I mean, imagine I was a little frustrated throughout the fight of not seeing him throw as much on the ground. And imagine if Francis Ngannou goes out there and ground and pounds somebody into oblivion the way that Anthony Johnson did to Ryan Bader, say. Yep. Oh, my God. The that could, scariest that could be the next step for him. Ever. Ever. Like it, his his scariest step ever, should be working ever. on that devastating ground and pound. Yeah. Now yeah, that he absolutely. knows he can hold guys down like that, like, can you imagine? Forget it. Forget but it. Like, Let's talk Omar, about where... I was going to say, o no, Omar kind of touched on it, but like none of what he did was like big, strong men wrestling. Like It wasn't like, I'm just stronger than you and I'm going to kind of grab you and we're going to fall down. Like It was technique the whole time. Mm -hmm. Like I, it, That's what was so stunning about it. Like It was like, all of a sudden, this guy knew exactly what to do in all these spots. Yeah, and he, to be fair, yeah. Francis Ngannou is a powerful, powerful man. He oh, used strength, a lot of that power. Yeah, but the fact that he was able to—I mean, if you go back and you watch that fight, you can see the man has shoulder control. Like he has yeah. shoulder pressure when he's down, when he's on top. Yeah. There's a reason why Gon can't get the fuck up for three rounds. Even the way he was getting to the hips from standing, like he was shooting great shots. Yeah, he pulled out the legs while they were on the on the fence together to get a takedown. Like, yep. I yeah. mean, it, yeah, I mean, look to to do that at that elite level, to have the confidence to do that, and and believe that it works. There's guys, I'm sure you could see all manner of guys that are in the UFC, in the gym, doing all of that, having no problem. They right. won't do it in a professional fight yeah, because yeah, yeah. they're not comfortable. It's not It's not their wheelhouse. Yep. So to see Nganu kind of have that evolution and have that confidence to do that and then do it well, I mean, you're just hating on the man if you don't appreciate it, really. Right. Many of the biggest stars in the sport, we don't always see that. You're not going to see Conor McGregor come out and with elite jujitsu and like out grapple somebody, you're not going to see Nate Diaz come out and throw devastating head kicks. It's just like you, you feel like it's just not going to happen. And that's what Engano just did this past weekend. Yes. Let's talk now about where these two gentlemen go from here. I have a feeling that Cyril Gan is going to stay in the UFC, but let's talk first and mainly about the future of the champion, Francis Ngannou. Omar, let me start with you on this. This has been in question in the past, what, the past several months of where Francis is. There's been a dispute with, between him and the UFC. Uh, he retained his belt, 
What do you see uh, in the near future and distant future of the champion, uh, Francis Ngannou? Yeah, I mean, basically, like you said, there's a lot of drama right now revolving Francis and his future. Um, Francis wants a lot of things in his contract, one of which is the freedom to go box, basically, if he wants to. Um, for context, the UFC has always had exclusive contracts with their fighters, meaning that when their fighters sign with them, they ain't fighting nowhere else. At best, they're able to compete in grappling competitions. Uh, but when it comes to combat sports, BKFC, One, Bellator, like any any MMA organization, any boxing organization, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. They're not allowed by contract. So right. it's not really a thought really that I feel like goes into a lot of their heads. Um, but Francis Ngannou thinks, and, and to be fair, I mean, I think the fight would sell. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think Francis Ngannou against Tyson Fury is asking Ngannou to get killed personally. Yeah. I don't want to see that. that. Yeah. I mean, listen, we've seen crazier fights at this point. I'll I mean, definitely I'd wa watch. I'd, watch. I'd sure. have to watch. Of course we'd watch. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, there, you know, there's a lot of things that are going down with his, what he wants. And so as of right now, the big thing is he's going to be out nine to 10 months at this point. Uh, is that what little, they said? I've been looking for a timeline all day. I saw he got the surgery. They said little, nine to 10 months. Yeah. A little, a little spoiler into the a MMA long sphere, time, you know? nine to 10 months. He's going to be out potentially with, with the repair to wow. his ACL and his MCL. Wow. What, what that really means though, is that the UFC is nine to 10 months to figure their shit out because realistically, as as if if we're able to believe everything that 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 uh, Ngannou has talked about regarding his contract, his contract is up by the end of 2022. Um, I think we had talked about we had some misconceptions about how those contracts worked, especially for champions and the renewals and all that kind of stuff. But it seems like his contract is up 2022 if they don't renew that contract. If that's the case, Francis Ngannou becomes a free agent, and chances are somebody else will pick him up. But what I can tell you, they will renew the contract. Why would they ever let him walk? Because Francis Ngannou is not trying to turn down what he wants. And what well, he yeah, but that's what I'm saying. They're going to renew it, and then he's going to say, I'm not fighting. They're not just going to say, go ahead and be a free agent. Oh, I don't think that's how that – I don't know if that's how that works. From, from the way that Ngannou made it sound is that his contract is done by the end of 2022, that he was done. That's the way he made it sound. I don't obviously we don't know the details, so I don't really know. But the whole thing was that was that if you win your belt, it triggers that you have to defend it. Maybe I, I I don't know. I don't want to be I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I thought that was the deal because I thought I heard him talking about how he was going to be locked in and he was just going to tell them he wasn't fighting until they offered him a, a new contract. And I think that's probably, I mean, that's probably true, but I think that's also, at some point, the contract probably expires. Like, there is a date that it probably expires. Well, and I think that's like that with know. everybody. Um, but anyway, supposedly his contract is up at the end of 2022. I guess we'll see what happens with that. But basically, don't expect Francis Ngannou to be back, I would assume, for the rest of 2022 at this point. Um, and so it would be a big possibility that we might see another interim title for yeah. the championship yeah. at this point. I was just going to say, is that an interim title or like, does he just get stripped, stripped. for a whole year? Well, they, remember, they, we've seen get stripped before Tony other than like bones, but Tony, well, Tony was an interim champ. He, he was stripped of the, his interim title. It's a little I mean, different. That's as, that's as rough as it gets though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Have we seen a, an actual champion be stripped before for injury? I'm saying, or do they always just get to keep it? I'm trying to think. I don't know. I don't know. I can't think off the top of my head. I'm sure something will come to us. Man, oh man. Let's let's keep going here. Let's plow through this and let's talk now about Cyril Ghan. Unless Mark, you have another word you want to say about Ghana's future. I was just gonna say that first of all. I think it would be very hard for the UFC to let a champion walk away. If he's insistent on the Fury thing, I really don't know if they're going to allow that. So yeah. maybe that is what ends up being the deal breaker. But I would be kind of surprised if the UFC let it be the visual that, like, the baddest man on the planet, our heavyweight champion of the world, is going to head out of here and go fight somewhere else. That would surprise me. So I kind of feel like it's going to work out. 
Yeah. It may take a long ass time, especially now that like Omar said, they have all this time to work with. It's probably going to be a lot of back and forth. Um, but what I was going to say is that now with this injury, whether it's an interim title or an undisputed title, I think we're getting John Jones and Stipe Miocic. Whoa. That's what so I think. N- neither of the two men who fought this past weekend. Well, I don't think Gon's getting a title shot off a loss. That would be surprising. Um, I so. Yeah, I guess so. Real but, quick. I mean, you never know. And if, if obviously, if Bones doesn't make it to the cage, then it could be gone. But I'm saying ideal world, I think they're probably trying to make Jones and Miocic. For, for interim, probably. Interim I mean, or, yeah, pro- yeah, probably interim at first, yeah. Real quick, Dominic Cruz was stripped of his title for injury. There, ah, you, there you go. Have yep, it. He was. There you go. There well you done. go. Well done. Uh, see what happens. Let's now pivot to. Is it? I hear some guys say Seedle gone. I hear some guys say, I don't know how to say it. Dude, Spanish, Cito. Portuguese, yeah, Brazilian, I, I'm good with. French is like my kryptonite, man. I think you just say I can't, Cito and you're fine. I just can't get it in the ear, in the mouth. Ma- you got to let it loose, is what it is. You might be thinking too much about how to say it. You just got to. Cito. Cito. Silgan, Silgan, I can't you channel your inner GSP. <laughs> that's different. That's Canadian French. Yes, yeah, I'm not the, impressed the, by your performance. I'm, I'm good not with impressed that. By your performance. I'm good with that. Okay, uh, let's talk about Gan. Uh, Mark, let's start with you first on this. Uh, put on your matchmaker hat, and uh, who do you see Gan matching up with next? I think there is one fight and one fight only that should be made. Greg Hardy. <laughs> that wasn't it. Okay. <laughs> uh, and that is Curtis Blades. Ooh. The only men to beat Curtis Blades are two huge power punchers, Nganu and Derek Lewis. Everyone else has gotten wrestled into dust for the most part. Uh, there's not really anyone for Blades to fight. He hasn't fought Stipe, so like that one could still happen, but he's kind of beaten everyone below him. He's lost to Lewis and Nganu. He's kind of stuck. And now there's this perfect opponent where after seeing what Francis Ngannou was just able to do to Cyril Gan and knowing he's yet to fight an actual wrestler in the UFC, I think it's high time we actually put him across from a wrestler and find out exactly where we stand. Because if Ooh. Curtis Blades is able to wrestle Gan into dust for five rounds like he's done to other guys, then it's probably time to say Cyril Gan might not be exactly what we thought he was. Well, so I think that's a fight you go to right now and, and you see what, what the deal is with, with each of those guys. I mean, my initial reaction to that is that that is a terrible matchup for Cyril Gaon. On paper, I mean. yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's specialist versus specialist, and I, I feel yes. like the wrestler is going to come out victorious in this one, man, because the the real question is not does Cyril Gaon have the wrestling? It does, does Cyril Gaon have the power to make a difference before he gets taken down? Well, that's which I don't think he will. Yeah. Well, the problem is we've already seen him have not really the best luck in getting back up once he's taken down, and that's really the problem. That's, for, I bet you Curtis Blade was drooling watching that fight, right? Because he knows he can beat the shit out of Cyril Gaon if he's able to take him down. I do want to give myself a little like a half pat on the back because if you may recall, I mentioned last week that we haven't seen Gaon fight a wrestler, and that it may be interesting to see him against Blades or Stipe and see what they could possibly do, and now that seems like even more of a thing after, after what we just watched. So I sensed it. I sensed it. Yeah. Yeah. I should have just gone all the way and picked Nganu via wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Shit. I wonder if that was a prop bet somewhere. (laughs) Nganu with two plus takedowns at like, (laughs) yeah. Plus 2000 or some crazy. Yeah. It's worth a million. Yeah. Yeah. But for real, I think that'd be, I think that'd be a really good fight. I think that, is easily the smartest fight to make for, for Gon right now. Unless Omar, it's you, like yeah. Francis is out and John, John Jones is fucking in jail and we need someone <laughs> to fight Stipe. Then it's like, maybe it has to be gone. But <laughs> that is what, let's just point out. That is what John Jones has done to his own reputation. <laughs> that, that is the assumption. I mean, <laughs> He would tell you to stop being so mean, but I mean, he, you're not wrong though. So, no, I'm not. Um, no. no. If it were me, I, I mean, at this point, I, I really want to see Gon versus Stipe a little bit more. I, I still don't have the confidence that John's going to come back. He's talking way too much shit, and he's just not doing anything. Um, so I, I'm I'm not really going to put him on my radar at this point. Um, 
But the Gon versus Stipe fight to me is basically the most technical fight you could have at heavyweight right now. And I need to see it. I need mm-hmm. to see how that goes. That'd be a great fight. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a great one too. Well, that being said, boys, uh, Francis and Ganu, whatever the future may hold, congrats to him for this first title defense and for being on the marquee this week. Let us now move on to the co-main event of this pay-per-view. The main event featured the top two of the promotion's heaviest division. <clears throat> and this co-main featured the top two fighters of the promotion's lightest men's division, that being flyweight. And boys, this was a close one. And I'm very interested to get uh, Mark and Omar's take on this. In the third meeting between Brandon, the assassin baby Moreno, and Davison Geha, de, what is his nickname? Geha de... Deus de Geha? Deus de Geha, the god yeah. of war. Davison Figueredo. It was Figueredo who snatched the crown back from Moreno, winning on the scorecards via unanimous decision. 48-47 on all three judges' scorecards. Uh, Omar, let's start with you this time. What was your reaction? What were your thoughts uh, for this uh, decision victory for for Figgy? This decision was more painful than my bout with COVID. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. This, uh, I, I went to Wild Wings for, uh, to watch this fight. Um, the wife had to do some studying for her, for her cosmetology license exam which she passed and is now a fully licensed cosmetologist hey, hey, Francesca. congratulations to the wife congrats um but i'm watching this now at, at at wall wings and i'm just i'm just so bummed out by how that fight went and looking at it objectively i could see why you lost right it was a close fight at the end of the day the, sure. the overall sentiment of the fight was power versus volume. Yes. The the problem was the accuracy, I feel like, from the volume, from Moreno, wasn't there. And so there was a lot of punches that didn't land the way that they should have. A lot of punches that didn't land at all. Um, and as few shots as Davidson was able to get in in general, those shots landed with a lot more power. Knocked mm-hmm. down Moreno twice, I think. If, if Was it only twice? Was it three? I, I was actually three. thinking about this earlier. Two it was three, three. Yeah. I kind of want to say it was three. I feel Definitely like it was two at and least one. Two. One was like a borderline, might it looked like a slip a little bit. Maybe it was two and a half. Call. But, yeah. you know, there's there was obviously just a lot more power behind Davidson's punches. Um, where I will give Davidson credit is his cardio. He did not look like he gassed for the entire fight, which is, I feel like, a little rare for him. He tends to gas, even in his previous fights, he tends to kind of get winded after, you know, the third or fourth round. So I, um, I heard... Not to cut you off, I heard Rogan say the day before the fight that he had his weight cut more under control than he ever has before. So I wonder if that had a lot to do with that. I would assume so. To be fair, I didn't care for the way he looks at feather at flyweight. Um, He looks crazy drained at flyweight. If he had a good weight cut, that's awesome. Good for him. I just don't care for the way he looks. He looks like he's taking a lot out of himself. Mm -hmm. And sidebar, he gained almost 20 pounds overnight. So we yeah. should put that in. It's a big cut. Well. It's a big cut. Yeah. So um, it was a uh, it was a difficult fight because there were certain moments where Moreno was was kind of taking the back foot, um, was waiting a lot more than we saw him wait in the first in, in the last couple fights. Um, Davidson was also waiting a lot more. was was a lot more patient in that fight. He wasn't going forward as much as he had in the past. Um, was kind of inviting uh, Moreno to kind of take the first strike and and kind of working off of the counters and things like that. Um, and I think it, I honestly, I think it took Moreno out of, out of pocket. I don't really think Moreno was expecting that kind of fight from, from Davidson. Um, and I think it kind of messed with his, I guess with the game plan or kind of how he was expecting to kind of to get to, to Figueredo. Um, to be fair, we also still talked about, you know, champions being able to, uh, to adjust and Moreno wasn't able to do that. Um, while the fight was competitive at no point. Did it feel like Moreno was like winning that fight, especially by the end of that fight? I, I didn't feel like Moreno had won that fight personally. Um, as difficult as that is for me to say, I just didn't feel like he won the fight. There were arguments to be made about who had won three rounds to two, um, but the fight, I just didn't feel like he'd won it. I don't feel like the fight is done. 
by any stretch of the imagination. I think there is very much unfinished business. Oh, for both sure. guys want it. Both guys want it. Hundred percent. And I think you know, I had not realized that there has not been a fourth fight in the UFC ever. No, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. It, we we talk about it so often. Wow. We talk about fourth fights all the time, and this, that, and the other. It's never happened. It makes sense because how often is there a draw? Like when it's right. two to one, somebody, it's a lot easier to be like, listen, it's two to one. We don't need to do a fourth. Right. Yeah. This scenario, it's like finally you're like, well, we kind of right. have to. Because of really, yeah. Because usually the third fight is the rubber match. Right. In this case, the fourth fight would be the rubber match because now right. it's even now. Right. I mean, you you might even need a fifth fight. An entire, you know. Oh my god. Imagine they did the fourth and they had another draw. Jesus, the division would just fucking. That would be the coolest thing ever, though. (laughs) But uh, that'll like never have a no contest. (laughs) What I think is what I think is is important to note, though, is that Davidson has run over a lot of guys. Three fights and he has not run over Moreno, even in this in this win. So there is something to be said about Moreno and the skills that he has and and how tough that kid is. Um, I'm still a Moreno fan. I am not a Davidson fan. He's done some. Some weird shit leading up to this fight. Some weird shit in the fight that I just didn't care for. Um, I think I texted you guys. I think he like pushed Moreno at one point during the fight. I was like, "Boom, Moreno, yes. this is a bitch." That's like, a bell. It was, was so was bad. <laughs> but, that was uh, how I know you love Moreno because like other guys will push guys, and you're like, "Yo, this shit's heating up." He pushed <laughs> right. Moreno, and you were like, <laughs> "Oh bullshit. my god, how dare he put his hands on my Brandon?" <laughs> I mean, he's Mark, probably not wrong. You're not Mark, wrong. <laughs> let me stick with you, Mark. Moreno was disappointed, obviously, and a little surprised. And he said afterwards that he thought that he won. Uh, he he kind of admitted that that Figueroa might have landed some more power shots, but he thought that he won. He he put on a better pace. He thought he had more volume, and he was surprised by the decision. He thought he won. What did you think? Were you surprised at the outcome of this fight? It was another close fight. Um, both of these fights, even on my rewatches, I was like, man, these were close fights. Like, there's some arguments to be made about about spots in these fights. Um, awesome freaking fight. These guys don't know how to have a bad one. But uh, it was close. I, I think they both looked better in some ways. So credit to both of them. But I do think the belt went around the right guy's waist. Um, I'll walk through it re- real quick, quicker than I did the, the last one. Um <laughs> I think Figgy snuck out round one very late. I think it was a very close round without anything too significant, but I think he did more. He had a flurry late that I feel like kind of broke it, and mostly behind the calf kicks, I think he wins round one. And overall, I think the calf kicks were a huge, huge differentiator from this fight to the last fight. Figueredo was blasting calf kicks every single round, and like – yeah, Moreno wasn't like hobbled or limping, but it doesn't always need to be that way. Like they were impactful. They were a factor. And even if they were not a factor, they were still getting him points either way. Like he was he was getting a lot of points from racking up hard calf kicks. So I credit him because that was a big adjustment. And Moreno didn't really know what to do about it. Um, round two was clearly a Moreno round. He found his groove a bit. He started firing some of his own calf kicks. Um, and he landed a lot of power cleanly to the head in that, in that round. So coming out of that, I was like, okay, it's one, one. I kind of thought maybe we were going to swing Brandon cause he seemed very like in a groove in, in round two, um, three, I thought Brandon was winning. And then I still had him ahead barely with five seconds left in the round when Figueredo dropped him. And then that was enough to swing it. Cause it was so, it was so close at that point. So I had a two, one. Four and five are really hard. They were hard for me live. They were hard for me on the rewatch. Like, I I really, if you want to make an argument for either guy in four and five, I'm like, you know what? I, it makes sense. I, I really think both of those rounds were so close. But even if you say you just split them, that would still be three, two figgy for me. So, like, I just feel like the right guy won. I feel like overall he won the fight. He dropped Moreno. We were just saying, was it two or three times? I kind of think it was three. Dropped him three times. The calf kicks, I feel like, were one of the most noticeable things to me all fight. He was blowing up his calf. He had a lump on his calf by the end of the fight. So, like, yeah, Moreno was getting his points. He was landing his shots. But I just feel like overall, big picture, mm-hmm. Figgy did win that fight. I feel like the right guy got the belt around his waist. Yeah, it sucks. I mean, Brandon Moreno is the sweetheart of the UFC right now. I mean, he's so easy to root for. 
and I think pretty much everybody was rooting for him except for Figueredo's family members and like best friends. Um, yeah, I don't think we have to put on our matchmaker hats for this one, guys, because both guys want the fourth fight. Moreno definitely wants to run it back, and Figueredo wants to run it back. Uh, so the division as of right now looks like it's being held up. I think you gotta. I think you gotta. Yeah. Um, you know what? Do, what do we have in that division? We have Car France is fighting Askarov, correct? Mm-hmm. And then we had Pantoja waiting. So yeah, I mean it. It's gonna work out. You probably make Pantoja either fight someone else, and then the winner of that fights the winner of France Askarov while they're waiting around. Or if Pantoja is not ready to fight, he just waits for the winner of Car France and Askarov. So either way, you just do that fight while the fourth is happening and it works out okay. It's not like there's anyone who's like, has this surefire, like, I can't believe I'm not getting my title shot right now. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so right. I, I think right. it works out fine, I, oddly enough, for guys fighting a fourth time. Yeah. What a great fight, man. Those those flyweights, man, they're so fast. Huh. So fast. And they still you hit like blame. trucks. Like, you know, they don't kill people all the time like Nganu does, but like, Oh yeah, Figueredo people still end up on their asses off. all the time. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, boys, let us uh, let's throw the rest of this card UFC 270 in Gano versus Gano. Let's throw it into our lightning round. For those who may not be familiar, our lightning round is our non-game show game show in which I just pitch. Uh, the outcomes of these fights to Mark and Omar and ask them to give me their lightning takes, which is, I would say, anywhere from one to three sentences uh, about their thoughts on the fight. Cool? Let's jump into it. it. On the main card, in a welterweight bout, Michel Pereira defeated Andre Fialio via unanimous decision 29-28 on all three judges' scorecards. Mark, go first. Uh, Round one, Fialio came out and kind of surprised people. But round two, holy hell, did Pereira put it on him. I think that round maybe should have even been 10-8. I mean, Pereira beat that man's ass. The explosiveness and the variety of strikes was just crazy. So much was landing clean. Like, I was almost like, man, move your head. Like, everything was so clean. Round three kind of was more competitive than two. um, But Pereira still took it, won the fight. Credit to him for coming back after the round one. And when that guy is flowing, he is a friggin' buzzsaw. Omar, Michel Pereira improves his winning streak now to four straight with this victory over the very tough Fialio. What's your take? I can't remember Pereira having such consistent cardio for three rounds. I don't know if he brought an oxygen tank with him or what, (laughs) but the fact that he was able to be as crazy as he kind of is, a little bit more tame, right? No backflips, no like 540 spins, right? But but the fact that he was able to still do a lot of crazy shit and contain that for three rounds without being gassed to the point where uh, uh, Andre was gassed, I thought was kind of impressive in and of itself. The first round for Andre I thought was fantastic. He was very technical, kind of pieced up Pereira a little bit in that first round. And then round two came out and and Pereira just beat the shit out of him. I don't know what happened. I don't know if he, like, the moment got to Andre or or if, if he just gassed by the end of the first round. I don't really know what happened. But Pereira took full advantage of it and came back to just beat on him for two rounds. It was great. Yep, yep. In a bantamweight bout, Saeed Nurmagomedov defeats Michigan's own Cody Stamen by submission via guillotine choke at 47 seconds of round number one. Omar, what was your take? I told you. I, 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 I can't be picking against the Dagestanis when it comes to the wrestling game. Can't, can't do it. Can't do it. Uh, it was. It, I mean, what can you say? It was a dominant performance took Cody Stamen into the world that Cody Stamen likes to be and just completely wrecked him. Mark, Saeed Nurmagomedov improves to 4-1 of the UFC and 15-2 and, uh, and two overall as a professional, getting the quick submission win over the very tough Cody Stamen. What's your take? Yeah, that's how you make a statement in your first big spot on a pay-per-view. Uh, Saeed somehow managed to look incredible in every facet of the game in a fight that lasted all of one minute. He, he covered every base in one minute. And he's a big boy at Bantamweight, so he's going to give a lot of guys problems. Kicking off the main card in a welterweight bout, Michael Morales defeated Trevin Giles via TKO with punches at four minutes and six seconds of round number one. Mark, go first. 
Uh, first off, Trevin Giles should have always been a welterweight. He looked way better at 170. And he was doing well until he got caught. Yeah. Morales landed that clean counter right. He swarmed really well and honestly got a stoppage that I didn't love. I'd have liked to see five, ten more seconds just to see what happened. But either way, great debut for a kid that has some hype, 22 years old, and we'll see where he goes from here. Omar, the 21-year-old Morales gets the TKO. Oh, I thought it was 22, my fault. Uh, the internet told me 21. It's all good. <laughs> uh, and I already wrote this down, so I'm just reading it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Morales gets the TKO over the talented Trevin Giles. What's your take? It's a fantastic finish. Um, I obviously never heard of Morales before. Um, Trevin Giles has had some good uh, some good uh, performances in the past, so I kind of had him winning just based off of that. and. And like I said, like Mark said, he was doing well up until he wasn't. Um, but when he got caught, man, he just got swarmed, and it was it was one of those it's one of those things where we talk about finishing instinct. That was it. That was finishing mm -hmm. instinct right there. Yeah. In the featured bout of the prelims, in a bantamweight bout, Victor Henry defeated uh, Heoni Barcelos via unanimous decision, earning a thirty twenty seven on all three judges' scorecards. Omar, go first. So I texted you guys this shit. When, when when we were watching the fight. Who the hell is Victor Henry and where yeah. the hell has he been? Yep. Yep. What the hell was that? That kid is yep. so good. So good. He's so good. I was like, I'm in the I'm just I'm just watching this fight. I'm just like, why the fuck is this kid so good? Where did he come from? <laughs> and, and and Barcelos is no slouch by any stretch of the imagination, but like he kinda of beat the shit out of him a little bit. You know, he took some shots for sure, took some clean shots and has a great chin to have taken those shots. But, like, he was piecing up Barcelos a lot in that fight. Uh, great decision. Great, great debut. If, if there's a Victor Henry train, get me a ticket. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens here. Mark, your reaction to Henry's impressive debut over Barcelos? Yeah, holy shit. What a fight. I mean, clap it up for both of those guys. What's crazy about it is that how many Barcelos – didn't even look bad. Like, he still looked yeah. good. Like, yeah. I was watching that. I was like, man, Honey Barcelos is so good. But, like, if I'm thinking that, how freaking good is Victor Henry? I mean, he was putting it on him. To, to come in on short notice and push a pace like that for all 15 minutes is insane. And they kept talking about how good his grappling is, which we didn't even see. At all. So how this guy <laughs> didn't get to the UFC till now is, like, I, blows my mind. But anyway, yeah, that's how you put your name on the map. In a welterweight bout, Jack Della Madalena defeats Pete Rodriguez via TKO by punches at two minutes and 59 seconds of round number one. Mark, go first. Yeah, this was another guy that I mentioned to you guys last week, um, along with Morales as kind of the two hyped debutantes on, on this card. Madalena more so. Um, kind of a lot of hype behind him. Certainly delivered. Uh, he was so clean, so smooth. It almost seemed like that was easy for him, to be honest. Uh, KO was devastating. He caught him bad standing to the point that he stood over him for a minute, and he was kind of like, should I hit this guy again? And the ref didn't stop it, and he kind of moved, and he had to crack him again bad. <laughs> and then, you know, that was enough. But, yeah, that was pretty devastating. Omar, what's your take on Madalena's impressive TKO? Yeah, it was great technique for sure. He had a great little pullback counter hook um, or counter straight. But – the, the kid he was fighting, to be honest, his striking seemed a little suspect. I agree with that. There's, they were, they were not even playing from the same kind of playbook. I, yeah. I, I would definitely, before I'm convinced on this kind of hype train that, that Madalena seems to be on, I need to see somebody with a little bit more striking prowess because whoever he fought either. And I think that was, Pete he was supposed to fight Worley name. Alves. Yeah. That was, that was the late replacement. So he was a debuting fighter as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Because so that makes sense. It, it, it's possible that kid is also better than he debuted to be, because he didn't pull the trigger almost at all. In fact, he was like going for things and stopping midway, which is basically inviting people to punch you square in the face. Yeah. Um, he was doing, I mean, as many wrong things as one person can do striking as they can. So <laughs> I want to I want to put that little asterisk asterisks asterisk uh, with that with that fight there but um but Madalena looked great I mean the technique is there regardless of how the other person was the technique is there so definitely want to see him against somebody else who has a little bit more tools sharpened but 
great, great performance. In a bantamweight bout, Tony Gravely defeated Simon Oliveira via unanimous decision, earning a 30-27 on all three judges' scorecards. Omar, sticking with you here, what's your take? Grindy. <laughs> Gravely is a grindy man. That boy will just wear on you until you don't want to be there anymore. Um, I'm interested to see where he goes, to be honest. That style works i feel like a lot up until a certain point once we start getting into the elites that shit doesn't work and they don't get away with those things easy so i'm interested to see how far this style could come and if he needs to adapt and change up a little bit and might see a a different gravelly in the future mark gravelly improves to three and two in the ufc and 22 and seven overall what would your take on him getting the ud here yeah Oliveira came out so hot like, I, I thought Gravely was done in that first guillotine. It looked so tight. It looked like he didn't have anywhere to go. But then he escapes. His grappling kind of takes over. As Omar said, he just freaking grinds him. Who wouldn't stay off him. Didn't give him any room to breathe. The story almost became his takedowns against Oliveira's constant guillotines because every time he went for a takedown, he was in a guillotine. It was almost like he knew it was coming, and he was like, well, I'm going to get him down. I'm, I'm going to have to fight out of this guillotine to actually get position. And then as the fight went on, the guillotines kind of started to become less threatening and Gravely kind of took over more and more. So he did a great job keeping the pressure on and and got the W. Moving on down the line, the first fight on the main prelims in the lightweight division, Matt Frivola defeated Gennaro Valdez via TKO by punches at three minutes and 15 seconds of the first round. Mark, sticking with you here, what's your reaction? Rogan said it. Frivola bet it all on that first round. He just went out strictly to be to kill or be killed and it worked for him um also just want to note from the post fight interview that matt frivola if you close your eyes sounds exactly like chris weidman check it out next time you might be right about that Uh, (laughs) okay omar matt the steam roller frivola getting it done what was your reaction i'm glad matt frivola is on uh on the up and up now at this point um he's had some rough few rough goings in the recent in the recent past so it was nice to see him get a dominant win um a good one for the highlight reel for sure and uh looking forward to see what else he's got next okay jumping down now into the early prelims in the women's strawweight division vanessa lil monster demopolis defeated silvana gomez juarez by submission via armbar omar what was your take of lil monster getting her i believe her first victory in the ufc she's been in the ufc before uh lost and was was went back down to i think lfa got another shot here in the ufc got her first ufc victory uh with a very memorable moment right after in her post-fight interview with rogan what was your reaction the the girl is super fortunate that things worked out for her because let's be serious that silviana gomez juarez that is somebody who you're going to need to look out for polishing up that jujitsu game that that you can do the power that that girl has in her hands she made that demopolis girl look like three different directions after she got punched square in her face (laughs) like dropped her bad swarmed her and to demopolis's credit her jujitsu game seems to be very very tight uh i believe she's credentialed as well i think she has she's a brown belt and i think she's won a couple of pan am championships if i'm not mistaken Mm mm-hmm so she's she's got right. some serious creds, and it showed. As soon as she got down to the ground, if you go if you go back and watch it, as soon as she got down to the ground, um, and uh, Juarez swarmed her, she she grabbed and locked the the <clears throat> right leg of Juarez, yep. and it was honestly it was done from there. Once you had that much control, especially over the elbow, she basically had free reign to do the right as much arm she of, of Juarez. You meant to say? Sorry, she grabbed the right arm of Juarez. You meant? Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, Demopolis you see, you grabbed that. the right arm of Juarez. Yeah. 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 Um, and 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 then she had it locked up really tight, and then basically just kind of pushed her, pushed Juarez's face out of the way, flipped her leg over, caught her in a mean, mean twisted arm bar, uh, and it was done from there. Fantastic comeback, but a great performance from Juarez up until that point. I, I'm still really interested to see what else Juarez has. Uh, but Demopolis has a great story. She was a, a former. Uh, Stripper. Uh, stripper, exotic dancer, that turned MMA fighter, and uh, yeah, it's good to see her. Good to see a win from her, but I'm still interested to see both of them fight, not just the one. Mark, what's your reaction? Vanessa Demopoulos getting her first UFC victory. 
Yeah, there's not a lot to analyze here. It was kind of a, a three-moment fight. It was Demopoulos getting absolutely floored by a right hand. Gomez Juarez just kind of lazily getting on top of her as if she wasn't a credentialed grappler and paying for it, getting armbarred shortly thereafter. And then Demopoulos jumping into the arms of Joe Rogan. So that was, that was about it. <laughs> that was probably the biggest moment of the fight and the most viral moment. Yeah. All right. And last one, guys, the in the first fight of the night in the women's flyweight division, Jasmine Jasu Devisius. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm butchering that name. Don't know her that well. Uh, she defeated Kay Hansen by unanimous decision, earning a 30 27, 29 28, and 29 28 on the judges' scorecards. Mark, let me start with you on this one. Yeah, I'm sorry that your namesake did not pull it out here. Granted, yeah. different spelling. If she had the O N, she would probably be stronger. That's probably why she lost. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's terrible. But seriously, the length and size of Jazz Devisius gave Kay Hansen real problems, like both in the striking and in the grappling. I'm not sure if Kay can hang at 125. She's been a straw weight previously. She came up here. Didn't look like it was the division that she should be in. Omar, what's your take of uh, Jasmine getting the win here? I'm not going to try to say her last name again. Uh, to be honest, it was a competitive fight. It, by no means did uh, did Jasmine you know run her over. Um, it, it, was a, it was a competitive fight, but she did have the edge in a lot of different areas. I think going into the third round, I want to say it was... Was it 1-1 going into the third round? Or did you have it three rounds the whole thing? I Pardon me wants to say I had it 3-0, but maybe not. I can't remember. I can't remember. I want to say it was 1-1. One, one, one judge definitely round. had it 29-28, so you could be right. Okay. I yeah, remember I mean, there was a 29 It was a competitive fight. Um, it, was, it was a very grindy fight. They did a lot of grappling, a lot of heavy grappling. Um, not a lot of visually stunning movements you know in that fight the third round ended up being a lot more striking than i thought was going to happen by the time that fight had gotten to that point um but uh it was it was a solid victory very competitive fight good to see the good to see a fight like that frankly to start off a card nice all right boys well that does it for this week's lightning round you know just real quick in terms of my namesake my last name is spelled hansen with an o h-n-s-o-n uh, but I also know that my family came from Norway in terms of the, the lineage that I have that's, that's, that I know is Norwegian. Uh. And then one day somebody told me, she, they were like, oh, you're Swedish. And I was like, no, Norwegian. They were like, no, you spell Hansen the way you spell it is the Swedish way. And I was like, oh, there you go. And it rocked my world. Great story. Oh, I thought you were going to say you found out that it used to be EN and that it somehow got changed in like immigration or something. I bet that's right, but I, I don't know uh, if that's true. Can you imagine immigration being so fucking petty to change one letter? Stupid. Oh, dude, they did so many ridiculous So much things. stuff. Dude, they changed if, people's whole last names yeah, when they oh, came yeah. into Ellis Island. Like, like For whole sure. names, though. For I don't sure. think they changed a letter, but they it changed whole been. last names. My ancestor it might have been like Johansson, spelled with N's and yes. S's everywhere. Right. That's, yeah. that's probably true. Yeah, yeah. could be. And the guy was just like, Hanson. <laughs> no, I'm not doing this. We're going to go with Hanson. I can say right. that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, gentlemen. Well, let us now put a bow on UFC 270 by finding out who rose and who fell in our very own ranking system. This is the Priya rankings. Mark, take it away. So we have a few notable ones this week. Uh, I'm going to give you guys three risers and one faller. The first riser is Saeed Nurmagomedov moving from number 42 to number 24 at Bantamweight, Woo-hoo! which is kind of more where his talent should have put him. He just hadn't really fought anyone yet. Now he does, gets a big win over Cody Stamen. Um, so certainly a big move up, and we'll see if he gets even higher than this. So he, he's my number 24 bantamweight now. Next one is Victor Henry, going from not being ranked at all, not even being in the UFC, to being my number 22 bantamweight. Wow. Two spots above Saeed Nurmagomedov, reason being he beat the man, who beat Saeed Nurmagomedov. You can guess who's number 23. It's Howney Barcelos. So Victor Henry goes to number 22 at Bantamweight right off the bat. We will see if it was like a one fight aberration or if the guy actually belongs in this kind of level that he's debuting at here in my rankings, but we'll we'll see. And then the other riser is another debutante uh, who we mentioned, Michael Morales goes from not ranked as well um, to my number 24 welterweight. 
So pretty high as well. Reason being Trevin Giles um, beat James Krause, who is, I, I could look for you guys, but he's like kind of right around 30 in my rankings. He certainly beat plenty of name Walter Waits. Um, so Michael Morales got a pretty legit opponent in his debut, jumps right in at, at a high ranking himself. So he's another one where we'll see if he can live up to it. Sometimes you get these guys that debut, it was the right matchup for them. And then we find out maybe they're not that great, but right now these guys are both debut pretty high in my rankings. Um, the one faller is Cody Stamen on the other end of that Saeed Nurmagomedov fight. Um, he goes from my number 19 bantamweight to my number 25. Of course, he's still near the top. He, he's, he certainly had his good wins, but he takes a little bit of a fall here. And that is okay. it for this week. Thank you, sir. You know, what is it like doing the, your own rankings? Is it like how much MMA math are you doing and how much does it like feel? I would say it's a blend. <laughs> I, try, I try to keep it a blend, but I do certainly factor in like, like, okay, so like this, the UFC does shit like this all the time and it makes me nuts. It's like, I'll fight you and I'll win. Then Omar will... No, see, I'm I'm not saying this how I want to say it, but it's hmm. <laughs> why am I why am I fucking this up right now? <laughs> I'll fight you and I'll win, and then Omar will fight you, and he'll win. More recently, but I already beat Omar like a year and a half ago, and they'll put him above me. <laughs> like that makes me nuts. Like how is he above oh. me if if both of our wins are against the same guy and I beat him a year and a half ago? So the UFC does that shit all the time. It's like super recency bias, and it makes me crazy. So that is one thing that I do not do. I, I value wins over guys. Hmm. All right. Well, Omar, let's jump into the MMA sphere. Tell us, buddy, what's, what headlines and things are going on. All right. Uh, so not a ton of things going on, to be honest. Uh, MMA world is still pretty pretty sleepy, give or take. Um, the big News has really just been about Francis Ngannou. He's been talking and going on different interviews, talking about his contract, um, his his you know pay disputes with the UFC, and how he doesn't want to get paid five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand for a fight plus pay per view points anymore. He thinks he deserves more than that. Um, so that's been really the big MMA story uh, for the last week. Um, we did talk about how Francis is going to be out at this point for nine to ten months. Uh, he's getting his knee repaired. Um, so he'll need that on top of, of uh, rehab, and then obviously he'll need to start training again. Um, interestingly enough, I, I uh, in an interview that they did with Fernand Lopez, he actually told Sirogan not to kick his leg. And he told him not to kick his leg because he thought Francis was bullshitting about the leg being injured. And he thought that and he thought he was baiting Sirogan to throw a naked leg kick so that he could land a bomb on his face. Huh. So he told Surogan, don't don't target the leg. Just keep kicking the way you're kicking, but don't target the leg. Wow. Which I think is super interesting. And it makes me wonder, like, now that you know that it's legit, like, how dumb do you feel? It's kind of over, overthinking it, man. Yeah. Maybe. God. You know? But to think that Francis is that petty to, like, put on a whole charade for a fake knee seems crazy to me. I forget. Somebody See, that... said of, like, Francis wore uh, knee uh... – Knee, knee pads, like, knee like, pads on both knees, so that it wouldn't be obvious which knee was injured. Right, I agree with that. I thought yeah. that right away. I was. I, like, I, I did the same you, thing. Yeah, I, I bet you a knee's hurt, but smart to put it on both knees. I thought that right away. Yep. But the Fernand Lopez thing kind of fits with his personality because he's a guy who we've said before kind of loves to make it about him, and that's a very make it about you thing to do. It's like to see that to see the knee pads and be like, this must be that he's trying to outsmart us, but he's not going to outsmart me because I'm smarter than him. And like, that's a very like just overblown, like you're putting yourself too into it type of take. Totally. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> oh, so Jackass four comes out next week. If you haven't seen the clip at this point, you, I totally recommend going to see Jackass. If you like those movies, it's going to be the same thing. And, and, and I love Jackass. So the wife and I will definitely be attending. But for, there's a which scene. doesn't mean much because you attend every movie that comes out. <laughs> That's kind of fair. <laughs> Omar's uh, a big movie guy. He's a big movie guy. Francis Ngannou is uh, on Jackass Four. He's in the movie. Jokes have been made that he got paid more to do Jackass Four than his last fight. <laughs> it's probably not true, right? Probably um, true. I bet it's true. But there is a clip online if you care to go watch it. I definitely recommend it. Where 
he punches one of the guys from Jackass square in the balls. And with a cup balls? on or no nothing? With a cup on. Oh, but let's be real. Oh, does it man. matter? Yeah. It, it, it doesn't. I mean. <laughs> oh, my God. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Hard? Like. Does it look like he punches him as hard as he can punch him? No, Probably definitely not as, not as hard okay, as he okay. can punch him. Oh, man. But I can tell you right now, the, the the face that he makes is actually like, like I feel like when you whenever you see those guys like get hit and stuff, like it's oh, like it's always these crazy expressions. You can see there was a moment where he knew he fucked up. It was mm. just a a blank like stare of regret. Oh mm. my god! And then it looked like tears were gonna start coming out afterwards. But there of was course. a moment where he knew he he done messed up. I bet he started dry heaving. Yikes. That's I thought I if in my head, vomit is a hundred percent guaranteed at that moment. I I can't imagine me not puking if I got punched square in the balls by a man that big. Oh, but oof! Now yeah. you're kind of making me want to see it now. Oh, yeah. it's gonna be so good! It's gonna be so good. <laughs> uh, next on the list, Jake Paul back in the news for an interesting reason, not fight related. Apparently, he uh, made some moves with an investor of his, and they have invested officially in the UFC's parent company, Endeavor. And their goal for this investment is to see if they can fix the UFC fighter pay from, quote-unquote, within. Um, I mean, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm about it. You know, I, 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 I don't necessarily know how that's going to work. But I appreciate the effort. Not gonna happen. I'm telling you right now. I'm calling it now, guys. Ain't I mean, as happen. long as as long as Dana White is alive and running nothing. that business, nothing's gonna change. They're gonna say thanks for the money. Cool. Yeah, pretty much. It would be interesting though, because Jake Paul is a real is somebody who has a lot of money, and it you know, I don't know what kind of like. Hold on how much control you need in that company, but I don't think they're anywhere near that because that company sold for $4 billion. I was just going to say, the UFC was was acquired for $4 billion. Yeah. Jake Paul has millions, but millions with an M. Yeah, He yeah. doesn't have, he, he, like, I don't care how much he has invested in the company. And Maybe I, he put in $5 million, $10 million of his, mo- of his own money. That's nothing. That's nothing. He's not going to have any pull. He's not going to have any sway. They're going to They're going to say, cool, Bro, this is just a headline. This is just Correct. publicity for Jake Paul to stay in the headlines. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't look like he's going in alone. Like I said, he does have another investor with him. But but you're right. I don't necessarily see this. Like, I don't know how this would work in the first place. But something to keep an eye on. Let's see if anything comes of it. But, you know, not holding my breath. <clears throat> Next on the list, Kenny Florian back in the news. We haven't heard about Ken Flo in quite some time. Oh, no. uh, somebody did an interview with him and they were trying to figure out why he's no longer on the UFC broadcasts. Um, he said, and I quote, I was asked to be a coach. I think it was on the ultimate fighter Latin America. Apparently because I said, no, I started slowly being removed from stuff. Now I'm pretty sure that he got removed from stuff after he got caught plagiarizing. Plagiarizing. Oh, really? What did he play? Oh, you guys didn't hear about that. What are you talking Maybe about? It's going to ring a bell when I hear it. Ken Flo got, I mean, oh, give us on, the me... short version. This was, dude, this was years ago. Yeah, he hasn't been uh, on the UFC commentary table for years. So he got caught plagiarizing some article. Um, f- this was back in 2016, it looks like. Oh, you mean um, actual writing? Like he wrote something? Yeah, because he was writing articles for Fox for like, uh, for like, know you know, for, for fights and things like that. And apparently he plagiarized portions of a preview article for a fight that was coming up. And mm. people called him out for it. Sure. And he got in trouble for it. And that was, to be honest, that's what I remember him starting to get taken like out of things because they removed him really? from the desk after that, shortly after, so on and so forth. I don't, I don't know. know why they would even ask him to, to host, to, 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 to do Ultimate Fighter Latin America. He wasn't even fighting. Maybe he means like someone wanted him as their assistant coach type of deal. Oh, maybe. Maybe. I guess that that's probably true. That's probably I feel true. like plagiarizing some MMA blog is a kind of a minor offense i agree i i also and, and when i was talking about this to my wife i was like he should have gotten in trouble for it because you shouldn't be stealing people's shit yeah that's it true. doesn't matter it, you shouldn't be stealing people's shit regardless of how unimportant they might be you shouldn't be stealing people's shit yep. second though i was like this is a lot though it's mma this is not like the new york times you know what i'm saying like you didn't have to ban him basically from the ufc this shit seems a little excessive it but, probably was a combination of things it very well might have been. Very well might have been. 
Um, but yeah, it was interesting to see Kenny Florian back in the news because he hasn't talked about it since we've kind of seen him disappear from from the broadcast. So, ah, I don't feel too bad. K- K- Ken Flo has done quite well for himself. Yeah, man has uh, has his own gym at this point, which apparently is doing really well. So more yeah. than that, my man commentates for Battle Bots, which me and my brother oh, yeah. loved when we were kids. So did I. It doesn't hold the same sway for me anymore like it used to. But damn, I loved BattleBots growing up. They made some wild shit back so then. So cool. It's going to really disappoint you guys to hear that I have no idea what that is. Oh. oh. Dude, it's people who are like uber geeks and actually build robots that fight each other in a glass cage. Oh, dude, I've seen this. Like a long like, there's time like ago, There's like hazards and like buzz saws. That like 10 years and, like, ago. Flamethrowers yes. that come out of the wall. They, they rebooted this. it. They revived okay. it. And Kenny Florian's one of the commentators okay. for it. I've yeah. seen it. I've seen it. Right. It's so cool. I love it. Every once in a while, I'll go on a BattleBots YouTube binge. It's the best. <laughs> they need to bring back American Gladiators. Oh, since they, we're talking dude, about have, vintage stuff, have classic. they rebooted American Gladiators like twice over the yeah, years? Maybe right. They need like to redo it ago. properly. Just did give it to it? the Rock. Let him. I was do. just gonna say, didn't the Rock do it once? Reboot no, it once? he did the Titan Games. He has his own version, basically, of the American mm. Gladiator. Yeah. Mm. It's really good, actually. I actually really <laughs> like that show. Anyway, we're getting off topic. Uh, Julia Pena wants a summer return, and she is not trying to fight in Brazil. She told Amanda to kick that oh. shit out of her head. Oh. <clears throat> Did you see the latest rumor shortly before we started this podcast? No. They are looking at them to coach tough. Ooh. Oh. For what? A 135 or 145? I, it didn't say. I mean, it could be heavyweight men for all we know. It might not be anything to do with their weight classes. That's true. Fair. That's but fair. Um, I, part of me when I saw that, I was like, man. If I had to watch Pena for a whole tough, I feel like I might not like her by the end of it. <laughs> I can see that. She's going to be like super <laughs> aggressive that whole time. Yeah. But uh, it would be, it'd be cool. Yeah. I actually think it would work out. I, again, if they're really trying to do something, they really should just start working on that 145 pound division. Because at this point. Yeah, dude, that would be cool. I, Imagine yeah. they coach their like future. Well, I guess that she's 135. And it would be Nunez's possible future opponents. But yeah, it'd be cool. Well, especially. Well, I guess it would be kind of weird to have Amanda coach the person who's going to fight her next for the 145 pound belt. So maybe not. Yeah. Damn it. That'd be great, though. Dude, um, it could be Adam Waits. Have you seen those rumors? Oh, of yeah, Adam Waits coming to, to, to UFC? Is that been, I've been seeing some rumors here and there that people think the UFC is adding Adam Waits this year. Women, Adam Waits is 110? 105? 105. 105. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, Yuri Prohaska. So we all know that. Uh, well, we may not all know. We're going to, though, because we're going to get into the fight announcements. Didn't say fight picks, baby. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> Yuri Prohaska is working with Henry Cejudo and John Jones on his wrestling. He is, wow. quote unquote, trying to level up his wrestling game. Wow. That's probably going to be the way to do it. That's scary. That's a good so, way to do it. Yep. I think it's interesting John Jones is even working with him. Um, but wow. I guess he, he's, he's really not probably not trying to go down anymore. to the light heavyweight anymore at this point. I guess so, yeah. yeah. So, um, all right, let's get into some of those fight announcements. Uh, normally I have these in order, but I don't right now. So just bear with me here. That's okay. Uh, first one on the list. I got a beautiful one. Charles Oliveira versus Justin Gaethje officially has been added to UFC 274 March, uh, May 7th. Uh, next on the list, we have Drykus Duplessis. Drykus. Drykus Duplessis. Drikus Duplessis. Oh, I like that. That's way better than what I said. (laughs) Drikus Duplessis versus Chris Curtis has been officially added to UFC 273 on April 9th. Very interested to see if this Chris Curtis resurgence is going to continue because that's another story that I think is really fun that uh, the people aren't really focusing on. So, Um, Next we have Tyson Pedro's return versus Ike Villanueva. Uh, he's be back on UFC Fight Night April 23rd. Uh, that is actually, I'm really excited to see Tyson Pedro back. He's been gone, I feel, what has it been, like two years? That's what I'm looking right now. I think he's been gone for over three years. Has it been three years? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I so yeah, well, I remember Long Tyson time. Pedro, at least for me, had high praise. Like, I was super interested to see what he was going to do in the, in the division. I think he did have a loss somewhere in there. Yeah, he um, had a couple. 
but he's he's still super talented, and I'm I'm really excited to see what he has going now with the light heavyweight division the way that it is. Yeah, de- December 2018, so over three oh, years. Yeah, wow. Man, he's been out so long, I forget why he's out. <laughs> I thought it was an injury at first, but three years seems like a lot. Like there's yeah, there's got to be more than just an injury. Glad he's back though. Yeah. Uh, we got the rematch for uh, Vicente Luque versus Bilal Muhammad. Yes. Ooh. That's going down UFC fight night, April 16th. Uh, with Bilal's recent performance, this fight is super, super interesting. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Like, that's, the, that's the one I asked for when he when he beat Wonderboy. That's the one I wanted to see, so I'm happy. So good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, next, the return of Gunny Gunner Nelson. Versus Claudio Silva. How long has Gunny been out? Has Gunny been out Forever. longer than 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 uh, Tyson Pedro? I don't think longer than that, but maybe two years. Is like, yeah. is he retired? Let's no. see. Yeah, more a little more than two years. Okay. I mean, approaching two and a half. Yeah. He's also had a bit of a a, a string of bad luck recently. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how he comes back because he's definitely taking a lot of time off. I know his circumstances have changed at home. He's got a kid now, I believe. Yep. Um, so he's, a, you know, we get to see these guys become dads and they either fight so much better or they fight a lot worse. So, <laughs> well, you know we'll what, Omar? Works out. I have a kid now and you don't see me taking two years off from this podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> you can thank your wife for that one. All, all I'm saying is I have a better work ethic than Gunnar Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next on the list, another banger. Thank you, Dan Hooker. Arnold Allen versus yes. Dan Hooker. The man Great cannot fight. go home, so he just takes another fight. <laughs> Added to UFC London, March 19th. Uh, this should be noted. This will be his fi- uh, featherweight debut here. Or not debut, but going back down to Return. featherweight. Return. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Antonina Shevchenko. Versus hold on, Courtney hold on. Casey. Hold on, real quick. Just about oh. Dan Hooker. I just want to say this one thing. I really hope that the UFC does something right by this guy. Like, just hearing more and more about his situation with New Zealand. Now he can't go home. Dude, his family can't go home either. His family's trapped in, uh, in Australia. And it's just like, I hope, I mean, I feel like it's not going to happen because the UFC just seems to always be business. But I hope that somebody cuts this man a check behind the scenes. Yeah. For like a million bucks and be like, here, like it's been like, you haven't seen your family for like 20 years. <laughs> it's like, to be fair, we've seen Dana White give people bags of cash before. Yeah. This is true. So yeah. it's totally possible. He would just walk up to him with a bag, like of like half a million dollars. Like, you know, you've been a real company man, a real stand up man through the, through the COVID thing. We know that you've been getting shafted left and right with this travel shit. Just take some of this free cash. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah. Send it to your hot wire. You know, wire it to your wife or whatever. Share it around. Yeah. That'd be cool. Anyway, it would be. That's my, that's my take. Uh, so Antonina Shevchenko versus Courtney Casey has been added to UFC Fight Night April 30th. It's actually kind of an interesting fight. I'm down to see what that how that turns out. Yeah. Macy Barber versus Montana De La Rosa, officially added to UFC Fight Night April 23rd. Good to see Macy Barber's return here. Uh, the official announcement of Glover Teixeira versus Yuri Prohaska set for UFC 274. So it will be, I'm assuming, co-headlining yeah, I 274. Would think. But I would usually think. heavier weights tend to go above. But but I'm assuming the popularity of the light heavyweight or the lightweight fight yeah. will probably take precedent. But we'll see what happens. Yeah. Either way, both of them are going down May 7th. Uh, and, and rumored to be in Brazil, which would be sick. Yes, 100%. You get Gaethje, considering... going, Gaethje going into Brazil, which you know he would have some sick interactions with the crowd and shit. And you get Glover getting the homecoming welcome in Brazil as the champ, which would be dope. And, I and can Charles tell you this, getting for, the homecoming welcome. For those fans who may have only started watching recently due to the pandemic, due to there not being anything to watch, and MMA was basically the, the, the one of the few things that was going on during the pandemic when all the other sports were shut down. And so if you happen to pick some things up and are into it now and never really watched things before, if you've never experienced a Brazilian crowd oh. watching a lot an event, I, I, I highly recommend that you don't miss that one coming up because Brazilian crowds are some of the most oh yeah ruthless mm-hmm. and entertaining crowds in the world. They're Every gonna tell... region kind of has their own thing. Brazil is ruthless no they're mercy gonna tell, 
Gaethje and Prohaska that they're going to die so many times. Oh. <laughs> you know what's sad is like I can't wait to hear the ooh vamos eh, yes. ooh vamos eh. I can't I can't wait I can't wait what is that yeah. what is that it's true you're, you're gonna, gonna die. die oh really yeah. yeah that's that's what the crowds chant over there yeah over here we just go woo <laughs> that's what we do here yeah. <laughs> a lot of wooing bro I always uh, reference that anytime someone's like like remember when like the crowd in was it Arizona or where was it when they booed Wei Lee and people were like, how dare they boo and, and not respect the Chinese fighter? I was like, motherfucker, like, they can root for the American. Like, we go to Brazil, they chant that they want you to die the whole time. Like, we yep. fans are allowed to voice an opinion. Yeah, like, you go to Japan, Japan is a pitch quiet yep. Yep. arena for the That's entire crazy. fight. Yeah, I love that. I love they, it. I love how different you, it you is. You hit a sweep in Japan, they're up in the air. Yep. They're yep. losing <laughs> their fucking minds off of yep. a sweep. And then they yeah. sit back down, and then they're quiet as a mouse while the yeah. fight goes on. No, I feel on. like in Japan, when a big blow is, is landed or something like a submission attempt, it's like from the quiet, the, the crowd just goes like, oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's so true. You don't ever hear the crowd, like, saying things. It's it's a collective, yeah. oh. Yeah. Oh. Then, then you get England and Ireland, which just sing the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> Sing about so anything. It doesn't even have love to do with it. the fight. They're singing. <laughs> Don't you? I love the variety. Oh, was that great. was that so, England that they were singing "Sweet Caroline"? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They really will sing a whole song. Credit oh, to yeah. an entire country for knowing all those songs, though. I mean, yeah. good for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's from soccer, dude. Everyone sings at soccer games, so those oh. soccer countries, they're fo- they're ready to sing. You gotta, you gotta love the culture, man. I, that's what, that's what I love about MMA. You get to experience all these different things for all the so same true. type of events. So I, I love it. Oh yeah. Uh, all right, off track again. Don't care. That was a good combo. <laughs> uh, Daniel De Silva versus little brother Francis Francisco Figueiredo uh, added yes. to UFC Fight Night April thirtieth. Uh, that is still in the same uh, realm of flyweight. So both Figueiredo brothers are flyweights. Cool. Uh, Norma Dumont versus Macy Chasson, targeted for UFC May, uh, UFC's May 7th event. That yeah, will be have, back at featherweight, actually. We have one one more featherweight, I guess, with Chasson yeah. going up. Yeah, that is a featherweight bout. Uh, Andrea Lee versus Vivian Arujo. Araujo. 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 Uh, that will be UFC Fight Night May 14th. Okay. That will be a flyweight bout. Patty Pimblett versus Kazula Vargas. So we get to see the return of Patty the Batty versus an unknown. UFC (laughs) Fight Night, April 16th. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that Patty's going to be taking the the route of of, uh, Sugar Sean O'Malley, where he's not fighting anybody important until they give him a real contract. And that's what that's what O'Malley did. O'Malley kind of went with all the cans until his contract expired, got paid a little bit more, and now he's going to start fighting contenders. So, yeah, I, I think we'll see, see a lot more guys start taking that that approach. Um, the return of big boy Chris Barnett. For those of you who may not remember the name, Chris Beast Barnett boy. was Beast the boy. Beast Boy. Oh, is it Beast Boy? Yeah. Beast I didn't boy. actually think he had a, a, a nickname. My bad. I thought it was Huggy Bear. I what think that's a different, hell? like, unofficial nickname. Uh. Uh, but Chris Barnett is the man who did a landed a spinning heel kick. To uh, John Vellante, Gian Vellante during his during poor man's retirement fight. Uh, <laughs> his, his sure dog literally says "Huggy Bear slash Beast Boy." Oh, it does it <laughs> does? I appreciate it. I like it. Uh, so he's gonna be fighting a man, and and I I I see this man's name, and all I hear is is Bisbing's voice. So bear with me. Chris Barnett versus Martin Bude added to UFC <laughs> Fight Night on April sixteenth. Bude. I see Bode. I just. All right, Thank you, Bisbing. Uh, Alexander Volkov versus the up and comer Tom Aspinall. This is a tall order for Aspinall. I did not think he was going to take a a fight this this big, this quick. Love it. In London, that's going to be dope. And I think that's the only reason he's doing it is because he's headlining London. I think that's the only reason he's taking a fight this big with the contract that he has. So cool. He was another one who had talked about taking a slow approach, working his way up slowly through the ranks. But this, I think, was just too big of an opportunity. The biggest win of his career. This would put Tom Aspinall on the map. 100%. 100%. If he does it in London, the way that crowd's going to be behind him, he's a star. 
March 19th, uh, that will be going down in London. Khalil Roundtree versus Carl Robinson, Roberson, excuse me, added to UFC Roundtree. Fight Night March 12th. Uh, also a light heavyweight bout. I don't I don't know if he's been switching or going up and down. I think he's been light heavyweight for a minute now. Right? Yeah, he's light heavyweight. Consistently? Yeah. Uh, Greg Hardy is on his return. Oh, not Roberson, versus... though. Roberson, I think. So, I, wait, did you mean him? No, I meant I meant Roundtree because I know he was a middleweight for a minute, but then he went up to light heavyweight. I just don't remember if he ever went back down. Yeah, Roundtree's been a light, light heavyweight for a while. I want to say Roberson had some middleweight fights, but maybe I'm wrong. Hmm. Uh, Greg Hardy's coming back versus Sergey Spivak. Uh, it's been rebooked for UFC 272. For those of you who don't remember, Greg Hardy got announced for that fight and then literally like split his finger open somehow. Huh. Uh, like a day after. So they had to rebook that fight. So that one's going down for UFC 272 on March 5th. And uh, that's all I have for you today. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you so much. Uh, Inside MMA Sphere. Sponsored Boom. by Patty the Batty Pimblet and his bowl cut. Uh, folks, like and subscribe. All the places at and new underscore MMA show. That being said, let us now turn to the future this coming weekend saturday night we have a bellator event bellator 273 bader versus moldovsky let us work up from the featured bout on their prelims daring the wolf caldwell versus enrique el fuente marzola mark let's start with you what are your thoughts on this matchup at bantamweight <clears throat> Yeah, so no UFC this weekend, but Bellator actually gives you a pretty solid card that actually has some depth, which is nice because you don't always get that with Bellator. Um, but yeah, so this is a prelim fight, and it's featuring Darren Caldwell, who's obviously the former Bantamweight champ of Bellator. Um, Odds-wise, he's a slight dog. He's actually even money, plus 100, uh, whereas Barzola is minus 120. So pretty, oh, nearly dead even. Um, but this fight... And, and the odds for it are like MMA weirdness in a nutshell. Darian Caldwell was the man in Bellator as recently as like three years ago or like mid-2018. We heard his name thrown around in, in discussions of how would he fare at the top of Bantamweight in the UFC and so on. He gets the matchup with Choji Horiguchi where they did the one-and-one in, in Risen and Bellator. It was a huge deal. He loses both. And at the time, it was like, all right, well, it's Kyoji Horiguchi. You know, it happens. The guy's great. Caldwell gets back on the horse, wins two fights, beats Henry Corrales, beats Adam Borix. But now he's dropped two more. He, he was up at featherweight. He lost to AJ McKee, so maybe it's understandable. But then he, he loses to Leandro Higo, who he had previously beaten. So, like, yeah, none of these losses are low-level competition at all. They're, they're good. But it just – it's the craziness of MMA how this guy went from, like, the man in Bellator – in, in the Bantamweight division to being an underdog against Enrique Barzola, who, yeah, he was in the UFC for a while, but he never even like cracked the top 30 in the UFC's mm -hmm. Bantamweight division. And he's favored over Darren Caldwell right now. So it's just wild to me how, how this shit works out. Um, with all that said, Barzola is certainly capable. Yes. The UFC let him go, but he was six, three and one in his 10 fight UFC run. So the guy's no joke. That that's a solid record. Um, None of his six UFC wins were against anyone too noteworthy, but he's certainly got a capable game. He's good everywhere. He pressures you. He never stops coming at you. He has the cardio, makes you work, all, all that. So if, if you're not ready for it, he, he's going to get you, and that, that's how he got a lot of guys. But if Darian Caldwell is still even close to what a lot of people thought Darian Caldwell was, then not only should he not be the underdog in this fight, he should be winning this fight and probably making a statement doing it. So we will see if he's still that guy or if he's kind of just fallen off. Um, I will say we get a competitive fight, but I think Caldwell is at least still close to that guy. So I, I think while it's close, I, I think he makes somewhat of a statement and, and gets it done. I'll say it's a decision, but, I, but gets it done. Omar, are you buying or selling that, that take from Mark in terms of Caldwell getting it done? Yeah, I would definitely buy it. Um, I, I actually really like Darian Caldwell. Um, I know I've seen a couple of his fights. I'm not as well-versed in the Bellator game as Mark is. Mark's got so much goddamn room in his brain for these fucking... All these people. I, I just... I don't. <laughs> I don't. Um, there's a lot of MMA now. There dude, is. Dude, it's so much. It's, it's getting more and more... so much MMA. It is getting um, more and more saturated. It is. 
but uh but i love fights like i'll watch fights all all day long the retaining a lot of the nuances from some of the other organizations is really where i personally have some trouble um but uh but yeah i definitely buy the the, the caldwell thing i think it's interesting that he's on the prelims um and henry corrales at this point is on the on the main card uh considering kind of how that happened but but again darren caldwell i think is a serious uh contender and and i look forward to seeing him win nice let's keep on moving up this card in a welter about welterweight bout kicking off the main card we have sabah uh hamasi taking on jaleel the realist willis mark let's start with you again on this one what's your take on this welterweight bout this is a good one um feels close to me the odds are pretty wide um which surprised me sabah hamasi is a plus 200 dog jaleel willis is minus 250 and some of these especially with bellator you can look around at different odds and you get odds that are like all over the place it's weird what bellator fights um so i'm just grab i forgot where even grabbed these from DraftKings. i want to say but um if you like any of these dogs like you can look at a guy who i'm telling you is plus 250 and you might see him plus 300 like bellator it's weird bellator odds are not as consistent site to site as ufc are so just throwing that out there um but yeah this is a good one sabah hamasi obviously had his three fight run in bellator where he kind of went from being sort i mean he was in the ufc but it didn't go well for him he was kind of like a nobody and he had this run where he kind of surged toward the top of some cards he had his chances against paul daly and against andre koroshkov he even had daly in some trouble for a time um but neither of those fights went his way and now he's got to kind of got to kind of step back and and try to turn back a young guy to keep that spot that he's earned for himself um Mm -hmm. jaleel willis is a guy who's coming up he's two and one in bellator he's 15 and three overall he's got a good record he lost his last fight um to muhammad berkamov who may be very good he's undefeated still so you know it might be a forgivable loss we're gonna we're gonna see where berkamov goes from here um Mm -hmm. but i feel like this is kind of a perfect fight right now to see exactly what Jaleel Willis is to see if Hamasi can kind of become more consistent, which he never has been able to do. Um, I think Hamasi is a live dog here. Like I, I wouldn't want to bet Willis at minus two fifty. though. I do think straight who wins the fight. I think I'm going to lean Willis. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm surprised Hamasi is this big of a dog. Cause I, I think it's close, but in terms of just picking a winner, I think if Willis can avoid the big shot that he might just be a little, better everywhere just slight edge striking slight edge if it goes to the mat so i i, I lean toward a willis decision omar any takes on willis or hamasi <clears throat> you know i was trying to remember who hamasi was because i I knew i had heard that name before and i and sleek sheep baby and looking at his record though he was <laughs> the guy who got messed up by uh by razak uh, abdul razak yes. hassan yes and then they had that controversy in the first fight then they ran it back and then he got slept in the yep. second one. Yep. And then he got cut from the UFC. So that boy had a rough go. And then looking at his record now, had a decent resurgence. Went on a four yeah. fight win streak till he fought Paul Daly. And Paul Daly still at this point is, you know, any day of the week, he can still knock you out. So you can't sleep on Paul Daly. And then he fought Andre Korshkov. I mean, that, that losing to Andre Korshkov will happen. Yeah. That so, one wasn't um, going to go well. Yeah, I mean, there, it, it might be a real positive going uh, direction that his career is starting to go back into, but he didn't win a single fight in the UFC. No. Yeah. yeah. Moving on down uh, the in the featherweight division uh, for Bellator, Henry O.K. Corrales takes on Aiden Lee. Uh, Mark, one last time, let me start with you first on this one. What's your take on Corrales Lee? So I actually agree with what Omar said. I feel like this one should be the prelim. And Caldwell's fight should be on the main card. I'm, I, I'm not sure why they stacked it this way. Um, this is another really close one odds-wise. Henry Corrales is even money, plus 100. Aiden Lee's slight favorite, minus 120. Um, I like Henry Corrales a lot. He just always comes to scrap. He's a Bellator stalwart. He's turned back plenty of these young guys before. Um, but I also like Aiden Lee. He's took his couple losses in Bellator. He lost to Saul Rogers, who's looking better and better. He lost to Aaron Pico, who obviously we love. Um, and, of course, Corrales KO'd Aaron Pico. So, a few years back, if you want to do a little MMA math here. Um, but I feel like the potential with Aiden Lee is there. He's much bigger. He's going to have a four-inch height advantage, five-inch reach advantage. I do think he's still evolving. He's the younger fighter by nine years. So, I could see myself regret this one while Lee is, like, splayed out on the canvas. But... 
I'm going to say Lee gets it done by decision. Omar, what's your take? Corrales, Lee. Yeah, so looking at Corrales' record, I now kind of remember who he is. Um, and realistically, Corrales is a guy who doesn't really seem to lose unless the, the guys are very, very good, unless they are the elite of the elite for the most part. And so I don't necessarily see Aiden Lee kind of being up to scratch in that department. Uh, so I think I think Corrales is going to walk away with the W here. Cool. And now we are going on to the co-main event in a lightweight bout. Benson Smooth, Henderson taking on uh, Mamedov. What's this guy's first name? Islam. Islam, that's right. Another Islam. Islam Mamedov. Mamedov? Probably Mamedov. Yep. We've got Bendo. He's now 38 years old, fighting out of Glendale, Arizona. And my man is trying to snap a three-fight losing streak. Mamedov, 32 from Dagestan. He's 20-1 and one as a professional coming in with a two-fight win streak. Uh, so, Omar, let's start with you this time. What's your take on Bendo taking on Mamedov the Dagestani? Benson's career has, has given me hives for, like, the longest time. Because... <laughs> He's he's kind of been a fighter who tries to skate the line of doing enough to win a fight without really trying to get into a fight. And then at some point I think he like had this realization that like he needed to be a little bit more aggressive and then he started losing. <laughs> and then and, 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 like, I really don't know what the hell is going on with his career because he's lost three in a row now, which I don't think has ever happened in his career up until this point. Um, he has lost to good guys. Huh? You know, Michael Chandler, Brett Primus, Jason Jackson. Um, but, like, as as good as Brett, Pr Brett Primus, not Primus, Primus, right? Yep. As good as Brett Primus is, in my head, he shouldn't be beating Benson Henderson. Maybe I'm wrong in that thought. I don't know. But that's just kind of how it is in my head. And once you start losing to the bread premises of the world as a Benson Henderson, in my head, you got to take a step back and try to figure out if you're even really still doing this for the right reasons, if, if you can even still do this at the highest level. Because that's not a great loss to have uh, as, as a Benson Henderson. So um, I say all that to say I don't know how much confidence I have in Benson Henderson anymore at this yeah. point to, to win a fight. Uh, so I, I'm probably going to go with a guy who seems to be beating the shit out of everybody who I would only assume is taking everybody and their mother down. And Benson Henderson has never really been great at that in defending those kind of attacks. So I'm going to go with, uh, Mehmet off here. I'll give Benson Henderson the, the benefit of the doubt with a decision loss. Okay. Mark, what's your take? Bendo versus Mamedov. So I don't get it. I don't get what Bellator is doing with Benson Henderson. Like, all right, they gave him premise in his last fight. Like, we'll see what happens. But he's lost three in a row now. He doesn't have that many fights left. There's got to be a funner fight for Benson Henderson to, to be showcased than to get thrown in there with a guy who hasn't lost in 13 years who just tries to grind people into dust and is not entertaining at all. Like I, I how that was the choice. I don't understand. Um, Benson is a huge dog. It's not, it's not an easy style matchup. It's, I, it's nothing for him. He's, he's plus three ten. Mamadov is minus 400. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't like it. I don't like the logic. Um, but yeah, Islam Mamadov is 20, one and one in his career. The last loss was 13 years ago. He ran through World Series of Fighting and PFL. He's 1-0 in Bellator already. Uh, he just beat Brent Primus, who is the man that just beat Benson Henderson. Um, he's going to have a 3-inch height advantage. He's going to have a 3-inch reach advantage. He's the larger guy in general. And he's got the kind of typical Dagestani wrestling that is very likely going to give trouble to Benson Henderson. Yep. Um, do I feel like Benson being over a three to one underdog is a bit aggressive? Yes. Do I think there's a way that he could win by just refusing the grappling and avoiding it at all costs and using that kind of more aggressive in and out striking style that he was showing at times against Brent premise? Yes. Do I trust Benson Henderson to do that and not grapple? Absolutely not. The guy can't help it. 
Yeah. Um, Realistically, but, I would rather see Benson Henderson be a little bit more aggressive with the grappling in this one. Not necessarily, you know, because here's the thing. Whenever you fight a wrestler or a grappler, a lot of times the, the expectation is you're not going, you, you don't want to get taken down. And so the whole game for the entire fight is you playing the game of not getting taken down. Right, We've yeah. seen sometimes where guys kind of take the initiative and take people down when they don't expect to be taken down in the first place. I'm not it's saying true. Benson Henderson is going to ragdoll this kid for three rounds, no. but at the same time, it, it, it might be to his benefit to put that kid on edge with some different thoughts. Because if you just keep running away from him and running away from the takedowns, the fight's going to go exactly the way we all think it's going to go. Yeah. And I his agree with that ground game is like Benson Henderson has serious ground credentials. He's a, yeah. he's oh, a yeah. serious jujitsu nerd, man. Yeah, yeah jujitsu wise. Yeah, I just but wish he, he was. He tends utilizes get, it more. He tends to struggle with like the grindy wrestle type, which is exactly what sure. Mamanov is. Yeah. But yeah, so I just mean to say that like yeah. I don't. I'm not saying Benson Henderson has no chance. I feel like we're not at a place where we can say that type of thing about Benson Henderson. Sure. Um. But at this stage of his career, I just can't pick him right now. I think the much safer <laughs> safer bet is that there's enough uh, grappling advantage for Mamadov that he's able to control enough of the fight, do a bit of damage here and there, and probably take a pretty safe decision, which I would think puts him very close to a title shot. If he beats Brent Primus and Benson Henderson back-to-back, -back, I feel like he's got to be pretty close to a title shot against Patricky Pitbull, so we'll see. All right, let us uh, move on to the main event now of this Bellator card, Bellator 273. Uh, a heavyweight title fight, champion versus interim champion. We have Ryan Bader versus Valentin Moldovsky. Bader, the 38-year-old fighting out of Chandler, Arizona. Uh, he is coming off of a knockout loss at the hands of Corey Beeston, 25-8 Anderson. Uh, in which uh, he l lost in the uh, light heavyweight Grand Prix, losing his light heavyweight title, and now here he's defending his heavyweight title. Uh, but he is only has only one win in his last four contests, which was a UD over Lyoto Machida. And then you have Moldovsky, 29 years old, out of Ukraine slash Russia. I don't really know how that works. Uh, he's Team Fedor, man. <laughs> Head trainer, Fedor Emelianenko. Uh, that's big. He's 11 and one as a pro. Uh, his only loss was five years ago uh, when he in his last fight under the Ryzen banner, and he's undefeated since in Bellator. He's now riding a five, uh, excuse me, a six fight win streak into this title unification bout. Uh, and his last fight, he won the Bellator interim uh, light heavyweight championship, defeating Tim Johnson uh, back in Bellator. Excuse me, yeah, heavyweight uh, interim heavyweight title against Tim Johnson at Bellator 261 back in June of 2021. Mark, let me start with you. What is your take on Ryan Bader versus uh, Valentin Moldovsky? Yeah, Bader's going to be having nightmares about Team Fedor if he ends up losing his light heavyweight title to Vadim Nemkov of Team Fedor and then loses his heavyweight title to Moldovsky of Team Fedor. That would be rough. Um, Odds-wise, he is the dog, plus 220. Moldovsky is minus 270. Personally thought it would be closer. So that says something about the belief people have in Moldovsky or the doubt they have in Bader at this point in his career. Either way, you could look at that. Um, but yeah, here we go. Give me the Ryan Bader W so we can set up my dream retirement fight for Fedor where he KOs Ryan Bader, hoists the Bellator Heavyweight Championship, and rides off into the Russian sunset. I need it. Uh, but that's a lot to ask. Uh, as I said, Bader is the dog. Moldovsky has looked really good. He's the younger guy by almost 10 years. He's capable everywhere. He's a really precise striker. And Bader has always been a guy that you can land on. So fighting a guy who is so precise with his strikes, Bader is going to be kind of playing with fire for this whole fight. But with that said, I like Bader a lot better as a heavyweight at this stage in his career. I think his speed helps him. Granted, Moldovsky is also very quick, so not as much in this matchup. And I think his chin is way better at heavyweight. It, it seems like he takes shots so much better in his heavyweight fights than he does in his light heavyweight fights, which may have something to do with the weight cut. But I just feel like he looks a lot more trustworthy as a, as a heavyweight. So I am intrigued by this matchup. Um, on top of that, yes, Moldovsky can 
wrestle. I don't know if he can Ryan Bader level wrestle because we actually saw Linton Vassell, who's a good wrestler in his own right, give Moldovsky some problems. So if Bader ever came in and went with a really wrestle heavy game plan, I think this could get interesting real quick. Um, and on top of that, it's not like Moldovsky has gotten here by having the greatest resume you've ever seen. Like the Bellator heavyweight division has kind of gotten a little shallow at this point. So yeah, he's been some guys, but there's no one on there that really I would say is as good as Ryan Bader. Mm-hmm. So there's still some questions out on, on Moldovsky. And then another thing is that he's not a huge heavyweight. So yeah, Bader only weighs in at like 230. So does Moldovsky. I think his last fight, he was like 235. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's a pretty interesting matchup for Bader. There, there's ways that he could win this. Um, I, I re- I'm really tempted to pick him. I really am, um, especially because I want him to win so I can get my Fedor Bader fight. I'm yep, just yep. struggling to trust Ryan Bader. So I, I kind of want to pick him to be interesting, considering it seems like most people are, are on Moldovsky. I don't think I can get myself to, to pull that trigger. Um, unless Bader goes really wrestling heavy, which I just don't think that he will, I think Moldovsky will have enough time on the feet that as the fight goes on, he can kind of pull away from Bader, start accumulating some damage, picking him apart win a decision and then unfortunately i don't know what we do for fedor's retirement fight maybe he just fights Bader anyway yeah maybe omar what's your take you got a pick i mean you guys know me okay. i ain't picking ryan bader <laughs> you you, you uh, already know i ain't picking ryan bader so uh i will be much much delighted to see moldovsky end up with a decision victory over ryan bader I will say Ryan Bader when he when he loses though he loses pretty goddamn spectacularly so I don't even know like I don't even know if he's if he could just get decisioned yeah you know what I mean like yeah. he seems like the guy who's gonna end up getting knocked out trying to win this fight and like we all talk about how it's gonna be super competitive and they're both very good and but Ryan Bader's the type to just go out there and just fuck up and get knocked out in like fifty seconds that's yeah. why I can't pick him. Yeah. It's just hard to trust. Yeah. It's hard to trust. So uh, I, like I will definitely be going with too. Moldovsky. That'll probably yeah. be his first knockout in like four years, <laughs> it looks like. So. <laughs> yeah, I like Moldovsky in this fight too. I just have a feeling about it. Cool. That's it. We did Boom. it. Boom. Previewed it. Bell Tour 273, Bader versus Moldovsky. Uh, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. We will recap uh, probably some, if not most of those fights next week. Yeah, For man. Sure. Any uh, any parting shots, boys? We got any trivia or anything today? Oh shit, trivia! Let me Come on, up. man. <laughs> I, I always forget about today because we don't put it in the show notes. That's true. We don't. We don't. Mark, you got to put them in the show notes. Yeah, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just pull one up real quick. <clears throat> Who did Max Holloway lose against in his UFC debut in 2012? Dustin Poirier. God damn, this is too easy. <laughs> That's it. I, I didn't know that one off the top of my head, so that was, that was a good one for Mark. Which of these fighters did Rashawn Evans not beat during his career? Uh, was it Noguera, Dan Henderson, Tito Ortiz, or Quentin Jackson? Who did he not beat? I can't remember who won that Quentin Jackson fight because that, that fight was garbage. It was. But I can't remember who won that fight because he very well might have won that fight, but, like, no one won that fight. We didn't win. They didn't win. It was a mess. Did Rashad beat Dan Henderson? Am Did I Rash- blank? That's my answer. Am I forgetting that he fought Dan Henderson? The answer is... Did he is... fight Tito Ortiz? I don't even think he fought <clears throat> Tito Oh, yeah, he beat Tito. Oh, he did? The answer yeah. is Noguera. Oh. So Rashad beat Dan Henderson? Was that like at the end of Dan? Why don't I remember that fight? It was a boring decision. So he he never fought Noguera? He did. He lost. Oh, wow. 2013. He split when decision, did he Dan fight Henderson. Rashad. He lost a split decision to Rashad. God damn. Wow, wow, man. I really can't picture that fight. Okay, here's a fun one. We'll end on this one. 
What is the name of the man who John Jones beat in his first UFC fight at UFC ah. 87? Andre Galvo. Yeah. Nope. Oh. Very- Andre Guzmao. Yes, Guzmao. God damn it. He set me up, though. I would have never gotten it without him. <laughs> uh, fun fact. I met Andre Guzmao at uh, Grand Central. Oh, yeah? Oh, really? I had no idea who he was, but he, like, he looks like a fighter. And I was like, are you a fighter? He's like, he like, yes, I fight UFC. He's like, I'm first fight of John Jones. Dude. That's so his claim to fame. <laughs> yeah, he's when like, watch my fight. He's like, it was close. I was like, uh, I will. And it was. It was pretty close. He fought John Jones to a decision. Yeah. When uh when I worked at the UFC uh, when I worked at the UFC when I worked at Apple in Buffalo, uh, I I, I like never really took a day off when I worked up there. I was like, it like I just started working as an adult and whatever, right? I took one fucking day off because I was sick. Happened to be the one day where Bigfoot Silva came into the store oh. to buy shit because he was on his way to a card in Toronto. I was gonna say, Damn. what was he doing in Buffalo? I was I died inside. Godzilla come all the way from Brazil to Buffalo, New York. Yeah. How interesting. My guess is he was probably doing like uh, promos and shit up until that point. But cool. yeah, crazy. I can't believe yeah, I missed man. that one. Yeah, definitely. All right, boys. I got to go to bed. This is my fucking head. It's yeah, down. man. Keep keep punching COVID back in, in the face. Yes. Yes. Uh, guys, like, subscribe. Uh, tell us who you're picking in Bader. Uh, 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 and excuse me, in the Bellator uh, fights that we went over, all the fights, we want to hear your picks as well. Yes, we all will right, get guys. better. I know I'm getting trying to get better at, at getting on YouTube and responding back to the comments. So please, uh, please leave us some comments and we get into some conversations. Amen. All right, folks, we will uh, check in next week. Later, boys. Peace. Peace. Peace.